I always think about the snake and the rope story, you know? Yeah. That Buddhist story, how the monk's like walking down the road and he sees what he thinks is a snake coiled up ahead and he like freaks out and gets super scared. And then as he keeps going, he's like, oh, it's just rope. Happy Mother's Day. It's a perfect day to talk about power inside of our bodies. Uh, mothers are a perfect example of the crazy, latent power of creation that exists inside of our flesh. You know, we all kind of learn about birth in, what, what is it, like seventh grade when you see that Secrets of Life <laughs> movie where they show the fetus like suspended in there and they're like, the secret of birth. But it's, it's crazy. <laughs> How many of you guys have witnessed a birth? That's it? Oh, okay, so that's better. But still not a lot, huh? I always like to tell everybody, you know, when I got pregnant, I was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> and I realized that I had never seen a baby. I didn't know how this was going to happen. And there was some fear, let me tell you, towards the end of like how this was going to come out of my body. Because um, you're not really like taught about that anywhere, and it's very awkward and sort of taboo, and you just kind of know from soap operas or dramas that it looks very painful. Um, but in fact, your body makes another person inside of there. Right? That's what really happens. And for me, I never felt more animal. Uh, when I was pregnant and then breastfeeding. My body then, after performing this feat of getting a human being out of there, was able to nourish and feed this human being with food that it made from my flesh, from my body. It just made some food. Uh, and I don't know that you can really describe what that feeling is like unless you've kind of done it. Uh, but it's really weird and marvelous and amazing and we all kind of like hang out in our bodies and we don't think about them very much unless what like something bad happens that that's when we'll usually like kind of be like oh yeah my body <laughs> i'm in this thing that has to like do stuff so it can go or you know when we're like eating we'll think about it sometimes because we have to think like what can i do to get more stuff in there <laughs> Right? Or, you know, like having sex, we'll think about it because it's good or bad, as the case may be. Um, hopefully more good than bad. Um, but those tend to be like the times when uh, we take our bodies into consideration. Um, and a lot of the esoteric disciplines try to investigate, you know, what are, the, what are these suits that we're walking around in really capable of doing? Kind of what, are, what is all the stuff that's hidden in there? Because if you guys have ever done something with your body that was completely crazy, you know what I'm talking about. Have any of you guys had anything physically happen to you that was completely nuts? Yeah. Yeah. So not that many people. Like what? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. If you had something crazy that doesn't usually occur, take your complete body over and then like happen to you, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? Like birth. birth. Or maybe you died. Or maybe you got electrically shocked. Yes. Anybody get electrocuted? Yeah, <laughs> probably a lot. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so that feeling of electrocution is a good example, right? Suddenly, there's something happening that isn't usually happening, and it releases some things that may be going on in there, right? So a big focus of the lecture today is how do we get power and even energy uh, from our flesh that can be contained in this kind of potentiality? How can we get access to it? How can we express it? What is it hidden, unraveled in this business in here? You know? Do you guys know, like, what, even like in, one, in a cell of your body, have, are you guys, most of you, familiar with, like, cells, right? You got like the nucleus, and you got like all this goo around it. 
and then you kind of got like the cell wall, right? But what, do you guys know what's contained in there? Like in your DNA? So much information going into prehistory, just like coiled up inside of every single cell inside of your body, right? Potentially, latently, just in yourself all the time, right? And I like to think about releasing potential in a couple ways. Uh, I mean, orgasm is like the easiest way for most people to think about, right? That's not something that happens to you all the time, I hope. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's something that is not your normal state, but it's hanging out in there as a possibility. You could possibly have that happen to you, right? And a huge amount of energy is released as a result. But usually, it's just kind of contained in there, not really doing anything. Unless it gets this catalyst to kind of light the fuse, and then the bomb goes off, right? So it's like a secret bomb <laughs> that hangs out in there, waiting to get the fuse lit, right? Another good example to me of that kind of potential energy that gets released is disease, right? How about like a rash? You don't usually have a rash all over your skin, I hope, right? But if there's some kind of heat that forms within your body through an imbalance, that's going to light the fuse and the rash bomb is going to go off, right? All of a sudden now, you got all this rash energy just took over. Potential energy that just got expressed, right? A sneeze, another good example, right? You, know, you guys know how fast your sneeze is? This is ridiculous. 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour is the average force of a sneeze. You guys can't even run that fast. Your sneeze can run faster than you can, right? So your body contains the potential energy to project something out of it at 100 miles an hour. That's like a gun, practically, right? It's like your sneeze could be like a gun, like a projectile, right? And sometimes it is if you hit someone with it, right? That's an action that your muscles can do. And have you guys ever like felt a sneeze and tried to stop it? Yeah, sometimes you can, but sometimes your whole business just is like completely overtaken and there's no stopping it. It's just gonna go. There's nothing you can do to stop that 100 mile an hour missile from coming out of your body, right? It just overtakes you completely. So those kinds of potential energies are, you know, not so crazy. They're kind of things we're familiar with. They happen all the time. Um, but in a lot of the esoteric and occult literature, they take it to places that go a little more intense like that. Like, what if your sneeze that just kind of happens automatically, what if you could develop that, right? What if you could develop your sneezing and project things at a thousand miles an hour? What if you could do Sneeze Olympics <laughs> and work on releasing an even greater potential ability that's contained in your flesh? You know, I'm kind of one of those uh, Guinness Book of World Records junkies. You guys ever check that out? Because people can do amazing things. Most of us don't really know because we don't know a lot of these people. But even just like amazing athletes, or crazy yoga guys, your physical body is capable of a lot of crazy stuff. Or even like a circus act. If you guys see Cirque du Soleil, that's nuts. The things that they can perform, the physical feats that they can perform with their body. So the limitations that we form in our mind of what our bodies that we're sitting in can do is probably one of the biggest hampering factors, I think, that like keeps our brains limited as well. Because we don't even know what the limitations of our flesh are, really. I mean, there's always these sensationalistic groups that try to explore the limitations of the flesh. A lot of them are in San Francisco, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. 
or at Burning Man and things like that. And they kind of do it in, you know, in, in methods that are trying to like push the limits in terms of like fakirs or, or things like that. What, what exactly are we capable of doing? So there's a lot of investigation into it, but honestly, I don't think they are even like pushing it as far as it'll go. Because they're just looking at it in terms of like a body. body. One of the things that happens a lot is there's like chemists and physicists, right? And they take all these chemicals and kind of physical laws and they say that they're true for atoms and planets, but then they're not true for biological organisms. You know what I'm talking about where there's like atomic physicists and they'll see that atoms behave in a particular fashion. And then they'll say that they don't behave in that way in biological organisms. Does that sound weird? Is there like a jacket that they put on once they get involved in biological organisms? That, so now this oxygen atom that might be in a, in a lab in the form of a gas, suddenly you put it in your flesh and now the scientists say like it's just not going to do the same things that it could do. Or a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom, good example, right? Do you guys know how many hydrogen atoms your body contains? Millions and billions of hydrogen atoms, right? Do you guys know what makes hydrogen bombs? Hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atoms, right? So I think that a big rift in the world is that we separate scientifically uh, the capacity for planets and atoms from our biological organisms. And that's people, animals, plants, the earth, you know, you name it. Any biological system, we want to try, this, listen, this is my, you guys want to, I can get on my soapbox for a second. But the only way we're going to get to unification theory, where like it's the same rules apply to planets and atoms, is if bodies are in there too. Right? Because those things are operating within your physical structure as well. So we have to start like incorporating some of these ideas into our bodies. So it's important and a good time, I think, with a lot of the repercussions from Fukushima to really talk a little bit about nuclear energy and radioactivity. You guys, have any, has anyone been following the repercussions of Fukushima? I know it was like in the news when it happened and now there's like, Oh, it was in, a, in the water and the milk a little bit, and uh-oh, there's like some weird cow things happening, and then, and then you have to go to like the blogs to get more information. Has anyone been reading about what's been happening? It's still leaking, right? It is. It's continuing to leak. And the tests that they've been doing on the oceans are pretty grim, you guys. You guys are eating seafood? Don't do that. <laughs> Don't eat fish right now, full of radiation. But so I think it's important to know, you know, what nuclear fusion and nuclear fission is. So the first kind of way, this is pretty cool, the first way we found out about nuclear radiation was with phosphorescence. You guys know what phosphorescence is? It's things that glow. Right? Like glow in the dark, glow sticks, and, and stuff like that. Everybody has those at raves. You guys know you go to raves mm -hmm. and you get those like little things that glow in the dark. That was how we first discovered radiation. Right? And after that, Ernest Rutherford uh, found out that there was radiation in atomic particles. Right? But he didn't release his findings right away because he thought all the scientists were going to make fun of him for being an alchemist. Right? So he kind of kept it hidden because he was like, this is too weird. Everyone's going to think I'm crazy. That stuff is emitting off of these atomic particles. And the truth is, is that atomic nuclear activity is alchemy. Right? It's alchemy. Do you guys know what one of the main things that happens in alchemy is? One of my favorite words, 
transmutation. <clears throat> transmutation. Okay? Alchemy, everybody knows, is like, oh, the wizard turns the lead into gold. Right? How does that happen? Any guesses? <laughs> yeah. Nuclear atomic transmutation. Okay, so if you have hydrogen, we'll take hydrogen and helium, okay? Those two guys can like go back and forth and change into each other. And what you do is you have to change the number of protons or neutrons in the nucleus of the atom by either taking them away or putting them in there. This is all, it's very simple, right? It's just addition, subtraction. Do you guys know what's the difference between lead and gold? One has more atomic particles, protons and neutrons. The other one has less atomic particles, protons and neutrons. So you put more into one and oh, there you got gold. You guys know you can make lead into gold in a particle accelerator? You just smoosh it together with other atoms and put, mush a bunch of protons into it and then you get gold. It's not super stable, because they're kind of like, oh, I don't know about this. I was led, so you got to like stabilize it and stuff. And you guys know what happens when it's not stable? Those protons and neutrons and particles that you smush together to kind of make it be this thing, they're like, ah, I'm going to leave. And then we get radiation. That's radiation, right? When they, when they take off and are tired of being part of that atom, right? It's really pretty simple. And nuclear fusion is when particles come together and get the smush. And fission is when they split apart and they take off. There is much more radiation when you split them apart. A huge amount of radiation when you take it and break it apart. Almost as much energy as is released when you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Think about how much energy is released when you guys come together compared to how much is released when you guys come apart. It's a little similar, right? How many of you guys have felt like tremendous surges of energy after a breakup, right? Fission. It's just fission, right? So, and you guys know what fission is used for mostly? Making bombs. That's what nuclear weapons, like the majority of nuclear weapons, or nukes, as we call them, those are fission based. And the way that the explosion is generated and the energy is released is they go in there and they break up Brad and Angelina, right? And then the result is this tremendous force of a release of that energy that's stored in the nucleus. So this is, this is what's the most important thing to understand, you guys, about this whole lecture, is that the energy that you see released when that bomb explodes, that's on the inside of the atom the entire time it exists. All the time. That bomb is sitting in there, hiding, waiting, for the fuse to get lit, right? Just like your rash, just like your orgasm, just like, you know, your sneeze. The explosive effect of the hydrogen bomb is contained in the nucleus of the darn thing for its entire existence. Okay, I know I'm saying this over and over, but to me, when you think about, like, how can that immense amount of energy be stored in something and just kind of hang out and not do anything? And then all of a sudden, nuclear bomb, right? Well, have any of you guys ever, like, repressed an emotion and then had it come out, like, all of a sudden? Maybe it was an emotion that got stuck in there when you were three years old from your dad. And then it hung out for like 50 years. And then nuclear bomb, right? 
that's a good way that I kind of like to see, you know, how we do that kind of thing inside of our body. Another good way that I like to describe it is with snakes. So we're going to talk a little bit about kundalini too, but in a minute, like, that release of potential energy in occult and esoteric sciences is usually described with snakes. Any of you guys had a pet snake? No? No snake guys, huh? Ooh, there's one in the back. Okay, maybe I'm the only creepy snake person here, but, um, when I was younger, I worked in this pet store, and in the basement, they had a 20-foot Burmese python. The owner would charge people a dollar to go in and take a look at the snake. The body of the snake was, like, this big around. For the first, like, three months that I worked at the pet store, that snake didn't move, ever. It never moved. We saw its tongue would come out sometimes. Like, if you went up to the cage, Sometimes you would get like a little tongue slither. But the majority of time, I, not even his tail would budge, right? Then we had to feed the snake. So this is kind of sad, don't get upset. Uh, but they got a rabbit, which was like this huge rabbit. It was like that big. And we had to put the rabbit in the room and then open the snake's door. And then everyone like closed the door and looked through the window to like see what was going to happen. And the rabbit like hops, and that snake that didn't move for like three months, in a second, like the rabbit was done. Like that was, it was the fastest thing I have ever seen. It was horrifying. That this huge like lump of brown, like kind of gushy flesh that had not moved a single inch, just whoosh, that was it, like in a second. So fast, I couldn't even believe it. Right? So when you hear all these stories of like kundalini being that serpent kind of energy that's potentially stored but not moving, that's what they're talking about. It's that like sit and not move for like months and then consume an entire rabbit in like one second. Can you guys imagine if you tried to not move for like two months and not eat I don't even think it drank much water. Like maybe a tiny bit. And then it would have a rabbit. And then it would be good for like another three months. And that was it. Right? Can you guys imagine like you doing that? <laughs> That's that kind of meditation that um, I think most of us can't really understand. Anything. And then all of a sudden, nuclear bomb, right? Well, have any of you guys ever like repressed an emotion and then had it come out like all of a sudden? Maybe it was an emotion that got stuck in there when you were three years old from your dad and then it hung out for like 50 years. And then nuclear bomb. Right? That's a good way that I kind of like to see, you know, how we do that kind of thing inside of our body. Another good way that I like to describe it is with snakes. So we're going to talk a little bit about kundalini too, but in a minute, like, that release of potential energy in occult and esoteric sciences is usually described with snakes. Any of you guys had a pet snake? No? No snake guys, huh? Ooh, there's one in the back. Okay, maybe I'm the only creepy snake person here, but, um, When I was younger, I worked in this pet store, and in the basement, they had a 20-foot Burmese python. The owner would charge people a dollar to go in and take a look at the snake. The body of the snake was, like, this big around. For the first, like, three months that I worked at the pet store, that snake didn't move, ever. It never moved. We saw its tongue would come out sometimes. Like if you went up to the cage, sometimes you would get like a little tongue slither. But the majority of time, I, not even his tail would budge, right? Then we had to feed the snake. So this is kind of sad, don't get upset. Uh, but they got a rabbit, which was like this huge rabbit. It was like that big. And we had to put the rabbit in the room and then open the snake's door and then everyone like, close the door and look through the window to like see what was going to happen. And the rabbit like hops and that snake that didn't move for like three months 
in a second, like the rabbit was done. Like that was, it was the fastest thing I have ever seen. It was horrifying. But this huge like lump of brown, like kind of gushy flesh that had not moved a single inch, just whoosh, that was it, like in a second. So fast, I couldn't even believe it, right? So when you hear all these stories of like Kundalini being that serpent kind of energy that's potentially stored but not moving, that's what they're talking about. It's that like sit and not move for like months and then consume an entire rabbit in like one second. Can you guys imagine if you tried to not move for like two months? And not eat, I don't even think it drank much water. Like maybe a tiny bit. And then it would have a rabbit and then it would be good for like another three months. And that was it, right? Can you guys imagine like you doing that? <laughs> That's that kind of meditation that um, I think most of us can't really understand. Um, so I was doing a little research about possibilities for nuclear expression in nature and the animal kingdom and stuff like this, right? Because my, my whole deal is like, well, if it can happen in, in nature, then we can probably get a little closer to seeing like what can happen inside of our own bodies, right? So, as I mentioned, one of the kind of first things with uh, that concept of radiation or nuclear activity is light, because we discover it through phosphorescent, right? Luminescence. And you guys know what light is, right? Light is, everybody knows, right? No, nobody knows? All these simple things are so complicated, right? Light is a form of energy. The form of energy. Oh, energy. What's that? Now that's getting tricky, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, just accept light as energy, right? Energy gets expressed in a few ways. You can have it come off as light. You can have it come off as heat, right? It can come out in different ways, right? So light is one of those. So, did you guys ever see those rainbow jellyfish? They make rainbows in their body. The cuttlefish are another just totally crazy ones. But there was those jellyfish that have rainbow lights that go around the outside. They had them at the Monterey Aquarium for a long time. I think they had them at the Long Beach one for a little while. Did you guys see these things? There are these clear, transparent jellyfish that have moving rainbows that go around the outside of their body, that's self-produced within their flesh, right? To me, those are like the supreme ultimo, like unicorns of the world <laughs> that can just make rainbows come out of the flesh of their body, you know? We all kind of get familiar with bioluminescence when we're kids uh, with like fireflies. Do any of you guys see fireflies when you're little? I know a lot of them are like in, in the Midwest or like out east. They're so beautiful. They make light inside their body. Do you guys know how they do that? That's like, I'm always like, what, how, wait a minute, <laughs> what? It's a chemical reaction usually. Bioluminescence is a chemical reaction that occurs when two chemicals get into contact with each other and then they glow, right? It makes a energy release and that energy comes out in the form of light, right? So it's just chemicals coming, there's not even any fancy like you have to heat it up in a lab or put it in some hermetic vessel, no, it's just like a girl meets a boy and then light, right? It's just like that. Certain chemicals that come together and the energy that they make gets released as light. Do you guys know? We've talked about this in my like spontaneous combustion lecture and I always like to remind people that you know that you could die by turning into a rainbow. Um, <laughs> strokes in the Tibetan literature. It's called the John Dro body. Uh, remember that. You don't have to go out by cancer, you can go rainbow. Um, so, 
<laughs> we emit a certain amount of light. You guys do. All you guys do. They did a study in Japan, and this is very fascinating to me, trying to trace the amount of photons released from people. And it's so weird. Do you guys know that biophoton, this is what it's called, biophoton studies, do you know where they're studying it? Not in America. There's no funding for biophotons in America, sorry. <laughs> only in Japan and Germany. Those are the only guys that care that we make light out of our bodies. Okay? It's the only place you can get paid to find out how light comes out of you. Um, they found out that the majority of light emitted from people comes out of your face. What? <laughs> That's so weird. And what do you say, like, when you see someone who you like or you love, your face lights up. Right? That's actually what they say. And they did, if you Google, like, biophoton human face light, it'll come up, the article I was reading, and they show these, like, ultra-red pictures of the people, and everything's, like, blue and kind of whatever. And then they would show them, like, their friends and stuff, and it was all, like, white around their face, and then, like, red and orange, and it would kind of, like, cool down everywhere else. But the majority of light is, gets emitted from your face. And esoterically, that's crazy. Because one of the things uh, that I mentioned in my research in my book, <laughs> um, there's this part about Moses. You guys know when Moses goes to get the Torah? You know, when Moses goes to get the Torah. He gets to go to heaven without dying. He doesn't have to die, but he gets to go up to heaven. He doesn't get to see God. Because you can't do that. That's off limits. But he goes up and the angels confer the Torah upon him. And you guys know what they say happened when he got the Torah? His, his face lit up. His face turned to light. Weird. Huh? And you guys know how they describe angels when you see them? Uh, does anybody watch that Supernatural show? I know it's really dorky, sorry, but I like it. Um, they have angels on there, and when the angel shows his true face, you can't look, because it's light. It's all light. The angel face is light. And that's all it is, right? So, how weird that we're putting off light in our faces, which is a form of radioactivity and energy, potential energy, that's stored inside the atoms that our cells are made of, that comes out. And I just had to talk about this little guy, too, as I was reading the bioluminescent article. Do you guys know there's a squid called the bobtail squid, which is cute anyway? And there are these really cute little squids. You guys know a lot of octopuses will release ink to like make a diversion and then they scoot away. Okay, so the bobtail squid, do you know what they do? They release a chunk of light. And that's how they make their getaway. They have a bioluminescent chemical reaction that is like their uh, getaway scheme. They just like poop out this big light package. <laughs> and then they take off. I just thought that was a good story <laughs> that I wanted to put in there. Then, so the other crazy light activity that happens in your body happens in every single cell. So, to get back to energy, which I think is a really important thing because you guys know, like when, when I say power in the flesh and nuclear and potential energy and energy at all, the way that we go, the way that you can get up and work is because you are releasing and producing energy, right? We are like these walking furnaces that are just cruising around letting off heat and light. Do you guys know, a lot of us think that happens because we eat food. Okay, how does eating food get turned into energy? How does breathing air and oxygen get turned into energy? You guys know this? It's a little biochemistry. You guys ready? ATP! Nerds, nerds. There is one molecule that does it. There is only one molecule 
in all living organisms that makes energy for us to live, to go. It's called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And that is converted in every single cell you have. Every single one gets that energy, but it's not in your cell, really. It's in these weird little aliens that are inside your cell called mitochondria. Some guys have heard of mitochondria maybe. How many of you guys know about mitochondria? Okay, so good, like a few. A lot of people hear about it because of that mitochondrial DNA they've used to like track genes back to Lucy, you know. Mitochondria, these little aliens, they weren't always part of our cells. According to the theory, they're kind of like these invaders that came in to organisms a long time ago. And the plant equivalent are the chloroplasts. They're these like uh, hijackers that just hang out in your cell. And you guys know the dry weight of your body if you dried you all out and took out all the water and everything? 70% of it would be mitochondria. So you're mostly made of these aliens. And do you know that mitochondrial DNA is different than your DNA? You have two kinds of DNA. One is regular DNA, which is you, and then the other is mitochondrial DNA, which are these aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It's weird. And the place that the ATP happens is inside of these little alien creatures. Without them, no go. You got no energy. Nothing would happen. You guys know how the energy is released from this ATP? Okay, it's basically like fission. It's like breaking up Brad and Angelina. The oxygen on the ATP is hanging on there, and there's this little, like, hammer. <laughs> If you look at the pictures, like if you go on YouTube, it's pretty hilarious. There's like a little hammer that goes boop, and then the oxygen goes like bam, and then the energy goes like Phew, and a bomb is released, essentially. Okay? A little hammer goes and hits the oxygen and burns it, and energy goes. The only way that I'm like moving so vigorously and sound is emitting out of my life, out of my mouth, or my life, also, is because little bombs are exploding with oxygen coming out of my ATP right now. You guys know how many of these little, ah, this little hammer is going like pew, 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 on the oxygen inside of my cells and my tongue right now, and making it move. Like if you look at the muscle, the way your muscles move, there's these little like hammer guys that go like pew, 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 and make the oxygen release and go, and that's how you get movement. It's explosions. It's totally explosions happening one after the other. I can't believe they don't teach it that way in science school because it's so much more interesting. And that's exactly what's going on. And you guys know, like, what's the most kind of more, one of the more flammable things that there are? Oxygen. The air we breathe, we're like these burning furnaces, like taking in this fuel to fuel our little bombastic uh, productions that take up the entirety of our lives, right? And that, those bombs, in fact, are what also make us age and grow old. We get so many bombs going off that we get what they call free radicals. And free radicals are oxygen they have all the outer electrons stripped off of them because they've like been blown up and then they're like, oh, I'm totally naked. I need some guys, some clothes, my jacket. I got to put on my jacket, right? So then they go to whatever is like around, like maybe on my eye wrinkle and they take those electrons and make more eye wrinkles and they're like, oh, I'm just going to like snag those, right? Hydrogens, which are what make hydrogen bombs, right? So that is happening in, to all of you in your flesh right now as you're sitting here. Little bombs going off and they're snagging other electrons. And in the article I read that was talking about the bioluminescence, they said that what is responsible for the photons being emitted are free radicals getting released. Free radicals getting released. Bombs going off, essentially, right? We are radiating, literally 
radiating, a little bit like Fukushima, although not quite that intense. That's the thing that I think a lot of people have trouble with too, is like, well, how can radiation be in biological organisms? Don't you die? Radiation makes you die, right? Well, like I said, it, that's what's responsible for aging. But what about radiation in nature? How does that work? Well, you guys know what happens? Mutation, which is the last part of the word transmutation. Right? Oh, now we're back to alchemy again. So this article I read, which has this crazy picture, which I just think we should pass around, they found out that they had buried these barrels of radioactive waste down at the bottom of the sea, because they do that, you know. That's what they do. They take the barrels of it, and they put it under sea. Can you guys see, like, this little spider webby thing? Something started to grow out of it. That is a life form that they don't know what it is, but it's biological in nature. That grow that is right now at this second, as I'm saying it, this dude is at the bottom of the ocean growing out of those radioactive barrels. They're calling it the creeping death. I'll pass it around. Because it's just too nuts. Um, and there's actually quite a few organisms that grow out of radioactive waste sites. Uh, a lot of them are fungus or bacteria. You guys know what they found in Chernobyl inside the plant? A rash of black mold was growing out of the radioactive waste. And not only that, it was thriving. It was eating the radioactive waste and consuming it and transforming it into food so it could make more bombs and go. It was actually using the waste from the bombs to, as fuel for its own bombs inside of its body. Are you guys impressed by that? <laughs> it's pretty impressive. So not only was there this black mold growing there, but then they also found several species of bacteria that can grow out of radioactive waste. And thankfully, there were some smarty pants people that figured out, oh wait, there's stuff that can eat radioactive waste. Maybe we should put it on our radioactive waste so we can eat it and transform it, right? So that's one of the things they're starting to do. And I know those are just bacteria and fungi, but you guys know it can happen in organisms that are bigger than bacteria and fungus. Do you guys know what else is happening in Chernobyl? Uh, this is just so crazy and Princess Mononoke. But there are radioactive boars that are taking over Germany. Oh. Yeah, that are coming from the Chernobyl site. <laughs> And it's becoming such a problem. You guys know how they figured this out. Hunters were killing the boars and they were selling the meat to people to eat. Yay! <laughs> karma, karma, karma. Um, and these boars were actually uh, reproducing at rates that were beyond what normal boars would do. And they found that the flesh contained radioactivity at levels which would exceed those where you would think these boars could survive. Mutation. Mutation. Caused by radioactivity. You know what? These boars were not dying of cancer. No cancer in the boars. Instead, big mutant radioactive boars. <laughs> <laughs> this is happening right now. So we all kind of think of like radioactivity and nuclear activity as something that can't happen within fleshy things because it causes cancer. But guess what happens when it doesn't cause cancer? Radioactive pores is what happens. Okay? So we need to understand this in our brains. 
Because it's happening <laughs> in reality. We can have Ninja Turtles. Yes! Like real ones. Ninja Turtles. <laughs> this is Simpson Fish. Okay? That are not only surviving this radioactivity, but they're consuming it as power for their flesh. <gasps> and their plans. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, have you guys seen Princess Mononoke? That's why it's horrifying, right? When you think about the radioactive boars in terms of Princess Mononoke, suddenly it's like not quite so funny. Yeah. Because that part where he dies and the ooze comes out of it. Aww. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Mutation, mutation is going to go back to transmutation and alchemy that I brought up earlier. So remember, transmutation is only when particles go back and forth on the atom. Lead and gold is only a matter of particles going back and forth, right? You guys know what the sun is? It's a giant nuclear, like radioactive heater, basically. So hydrogen and helium get fused and fizzed, <laughs> it's a weird word. they get fused and fizzed over and over and over, and that's what makes the sun. It's constant transmutation occurring every second between hydrogen and helium, and that is what is releasing the energy and making the sun. That's what makes it go, alchemy. Alchemy makes it go, right? Do you guys know you have hydrogen and helium in your body? Yeah. So, guess what happens if transmutation happens in your body? Okay, now we're getting to the Jesus business part of the lecture, right? There's this whole thing called biological transmutation. Have you guys heard of this? Of course not. They don't tell anybody about this. In fact, the fellow that was the predominant factor in studying biological transmutation, his name was Louis Curvran, a very nice gentleman, who was nominated for the Nobel Prize, but he had that yanked away from him once the scientists found out what it was he was trying to tell people could happen. What Louis Curvran found out was that chickens could eat stuff that didn't have calcium, and they could still make eggs. Okay. For philosophers, maybe you just kind of like had a heart attack, because that's like, or mathematicians even have problems with this too. Because how can you make calcium when there's no calcium going into your body? Okay, so he thought, all right, well let's just see how far can we take this. So he bought himself some chickens, and he fed them no calcium at all. It's very, it's science, you guys, scientific, okay? No calcium entered the chicken mouth. And yet, the eggs continued to come out. Okay? Okay, so some of the scientists said, Oh, Lewis, the calcium's just coming from their bones. You don't feed it to them, it gets leached from their bones, and then it's going into the eggs. So, as a typical scientist, he did some dissection, probably after dinner, a nice chicken dinner, and he looked at the bones, which were in fact intact and had calcium levels that were consistent with regular chicken bones. So now here we have this mathematical dilemma. Where is this calcium that the chicken is making the egg with? I mean, this is like the whole which came first, the chicken or the egg thing. Now it becomes suddenly very fascinating because you can't make a bunch of eggs. You guys know why? Do you guys know what eggshells are made out of? Calcium. Calcium, okay? So how are you having a bunch of eggshells come out of something that has no calcium going into it? Big problem. Wizard stuff starts to happen now. Okay, you know what he figured out? Transmutation is occurring inside the bodies of these chickens to make calcium out of stuff like oxygen, hydrogen, silicon, carbon, that's rearranging atomic particles to make calcium within the body. But wait, that's crazy, right? 
Okay, most scientists say this is impossible because in order to have nuclear fusion or nuclear fission to happen, do you guys know what has to happen? You need a lot of heat and pressure, right? Kind of like if you're going to try to make a diamond, right? You have to heat it up and pressurize it, and that's what makes the bomb go. That's what makes the sun happen. There's an awful lot of heat and pressure happening. So the scientists are like, well, if these chickens are just making calcium biologically inside of their bodies, they would be radioactive and would be emitting all kinds of stuff, right? Unless they're emitting light, right? Unless it's coming off as light. Oh, okay. Now the mathematical equation can start to balance out. And he, he released and published his studies. You guys can Google him, Lewis Kirkram, and found out that in fact, this was true and occurring. That alchemy is happening inside of your physical body, just like chickens making eggs, right? The other guy, um, that was a couple uh, years before Louis Curvran was a student of the alchemist Paracelsus. His name was von Helmont, a German foe. Have you guys ever heard of von Helmont? So he did this experiment where he took a seed and he put it in like a measured amount of soil, some dirt. He took a bunch of dirt and he put the seed in there. The only thing he added was water, so we got H2O. And then there's air, which is like oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and some other various sundry particles floating around, right? So those are like what happened. So the seed grew into a tree, grew into a whole tree. Where are the particles coming from to make, you guys know what a tree is mostly made out of? Air. I like that. <laughs> Carbon. Carbon. A carbon atom came out of the seed and made more carbon atoms out of what? Air and water. How are you going to make carbon out of air and water? Transmutation. Transmutation. He weighed the soil after the tree had been full grown and found that it was only missing two ounces. Two ounces of material out of like 200 pounds or something like that. So an entire organism grew without having those materials added to it. That's like crazy. Because how do you get something from nothing? If you have no carbon going into the tree, how is it making carbon to make its flesh? Only answer is alchemy. That's all we got for that. Right? And the findings of von Helmont were actually similarly laughed at by the scientific community. Right? You can think about it similarly on Mother's Day, appropriately enough, how do you get from a zygote to full-on baby status? Now people say, well your mom's eating a bunch of stuff, right? Which most moms do. Okay, how about if you're a mom in Ethiopia and you are hardly eating anything at all? You guys know there's some moms that eat teeny tiny amounts, like if you're in a starving country, and yet the baby gets produced anyway. The baby grows, but there's no fuel and particulates, and it's not taking it out of the mother's body either. Right? How is that happening? A little bit like the tree, right? Biological transmutation. This is something that I think that everybody kind of needs to know about, you know? In order to consider how things can biologically occur without having the ingredients present, the cells do alchemy, cellular alchemy on that level. So now we're talking about some yoga business, right? So yogis 
are another really good example of this that I always like to, to make. Because everyone thinks like you need to keep going by eating, right? Which is true, because you'll probably starve if you don't eat. Unless you're a yogi. You guys remember that Indian guy that they monitored for like 400 days? He was, how old was he? Like 90, right? I can't remember. Does anyone know what article I'm talking about? There's been a couple. Yeah, there's been a few. One of the, this was like monitored at university hospitals, you guys. This wasn't like a bunch of schmoes like just looking at the guys. They were hooked up to machines and stuff. And this guy didn't eat for 400 days. He had like a little bit of water, you know? But his body kept going and was perfectly fine. Most people would starve. What's the difference between the yogi and someone that starves? You guys know what the difference is? Release of potential energy. He knows how to make his bombs go off on the inside. All those oxygen bombs that we get when the ATP goes, Mr. Yogi knows how to make them go. That's the difference between him and someone that starves after not eating for like two weeks. Right? If you don't know how to make your bombs go off, you're not going to go. And yet, if you do know how to make those bombs go off, you cannot eat for like 400 days. Right? Because the potential, the, all those sneezes, he's using them for fuel, to fuel his body. Right? Those potential orgasms or rashes, instead of having them come out in this uncontrollable manner, the yogi is employing techniques in order to get them to go. Right? There was, there's so much good research on crazy yogi stuff. Do you, any of you guys read like some of the stuff that yogis can do? It's pretty good. Um, there's this one study, it was published in 1958 by two Indian researchers named, this is going to be really hard to say, I'm sorry, uh, Satyana Rayana Murthy and B.P. Shastri. That's an easier one to Google. If you guys Google B.P. Shastri, it'll come up. They did studies on a yogi who could stop his heart from beating detectively, so you couldn't detect his heartbeat. It was so slow, it was like snake style, where I went to so not moving and so slow that the EKG or EEG, which one's the heart? The EKG? Yeah, oh yeah, cardio. Uh, so you couldn't, the, it couldn't pick it up. He went totally snaky. There was another guy in this study, this is so good, he could move food back and forth in his small intestine. You'd be like, oh, we're going to scoot it over here. Okay, now to the left. We'll just move it over there. Okay, so do you guys know what that means is he had conscious control over unconscious bodily activities, right? They always say, like, your small intestines, that's an unconscious motor system that goes from your nerves without you having to think, okay, small intestine, move that food along and digest that food. Not like you go like, I want to I wanna reach out and touch you. That's like a conscious motor system, right? But your small intestines just go. You don't have to tell them what to do. But he had body consciousness and was able to scooch his food around in there, right? So you get body consciousness and you can release the atomic bombs and your oxygen that's waiting to be utilized as energy. You can make the little hammer drop and go right? Without having to ingest and consume all this stuff, because it's already contained there within your flesh. And to me, the implications of that really is like, we put so much uh, reliance upon outer things to make us be able to go and do stuff. We are so reliant on outside sources for our abilities to do things. Like, okay, even how I started having a baby. Most women are like, I can't have a baby. I have to go have a C-section and just have the doctor pull it out. Right? We are so far removed from our own abilities to control 
and experience what's happening in our bodies that we just think we have no control over it whatsoever. Right? But who are these stories of people that are enlightened, that are yogis, that are the Jesuses, that are the Buddhas? These are people who have control over the bombs that are inside of them. Right? They're the ones that are emitting the radiation, that are emitting the light consciously. Right? Consciously putting light out. Instead of just having their face light up when they see people that they like, like the studies in Japan, they're lighting their face up always through conscious attention. Right? So this is, I'm going to give you guys some homework. Are you guys ready? <laughs> I want you guys to think about lighting up your face and spend time concentrating on light coming out of your face and emitting and producing light. Because you guys, how are these messiahs and enlightened people depicted in art? They got halos that are painted gold like light. They're making light come out. They are suns. They're transmutators. What was the thing that Jesus could do? He could transmutate water into wine. He could make stuff out of nothing. He could make fish and bread come out of nothing. Just like a tree coming out of a seed. Just like an egg coming out of a chicken. Got no calcium? No problem. I'll make you some fish. Transmutation, alchemy, sunshine, right? He's controlling his sun and his ability to produce that from his own physical form. That's what, like, bombs inside of us are. That's alchemy doesn't have to happen in the head of a nuclear missile, right? It's actually occurring in every cell inside your body. If something can happen in the head of a nuclear missile, I promise you it can happen inside of your body. Anything that can happen anywhere can happen inside of your body. Because you know what? It's made of the same stuff that's happening out there. It's not made out of some alien material. It's the same atoms are involved in both places, right? So I want everyone to spend at least five or ten minutes thinking about light coming out of their faces. And do some experiments. Try and like project it on people. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens. Okay, so practice thinking about light coming out of your face. And the next time you see someone, just kind of go <laughs> <laughs> and see what their reaction is. See what they do. I want to know. Because maybe they'll go like, oh, wow, you're like glowing. Has anyone ever told you guys you're glowing? You know when people say you're glowing? Right. When you're pregnant. <laughs> oh, so good, right? <laughs> so good. So try and make a pregnant glow. <laughs> by making bombs go off inside your face, okay? I want a full report. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. That's all I have today.